Okay, why don't we begin in prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord Jesus Christ, you who said, who said that when two or three are gathered in your name, you would be here among us. We ask you to be here, uh, sending down your Holy Spirit upon our community, uh, that we might be transformed by your love and become givers of life. To you, who is above all things, be glory both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Uh, Andy, I think you've got your introduction ready. Uh, Professor David Clayton is an internationally known artist, teacher, author, composer, and broadcaster. He is provost of Pontifex University, a canonically approved Catholic university faithful to the magisterium which offers online programs, including a Master of Sacred Arts and Doctorate in Theology. His blog and podcast can be found at thewayofbeauty.org. Trained in both the sacred art tradition of Byzantine iconography and as a portrait painter in the style of Western classical naturalism, he has had many prominent commissions in both the UK and the US. Please join me in welcoming Professor Clayton. Professor Clayton, the webinar is all yours. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. I, I was going to say it's nice to be here, or I don't know, it's nice to be there. I don't know what the word <laughs> is. Nice to be there with you. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be invited to speak for the Institute of Catholic Culture again. And um, I'm going to talk about the Book of Kells. And I just uh, want to, if I just do my screen share, we went through this before. And okay. Right, you should be able to see that. So there is a picture of, uh, I, th I think it's a replica of the Book of Kells. Um, now, I am um, not an art historian, and I always come at uh, these things from the point of view of an artist. And I'm an artist who is interested in uh, learning about the art of the past so that we can create art in the present that will draw people to the faith. And so... What, what I want to do beyond that, I mean, part of my personal mission, if you like, so much of what I, I'm interested in, is the evangelization of the culture. So I'm always thinking, when I look back at these great and beautiful works of the past, first of all, how can we emulate this today? So what are the methods? What's behind the creation of it? Um, and then also, should we, or should we, do an exact replica? Should we look at some underlying principles and think about whether or not uh, we can adapt what was done to suit the uh, today? Uh, we live in a very different time from the uh, from the tenth century when this was, this, this book was made, and so it might not be appropriate. To just for, even if we could do it today, I don't know that it would be possible. There's probably some people around who could do the calligraphy and the art. Um, in this style, and is it w worth commissioning something exactly like this today? Um, and if not, uh, if so, why? If not, how would we adapt it? So I just want you to be aware of that as we go through it. So I, I don't focus a lot on the historical details or um, on the, uh, the, the, the history of it uh, particularly. I'm going to cover some. Uh, but you'll see where, how, as I begin to talk about it, uh, where my interest lies. Now, first of all, I, something to think about when you're imagining this, I, the size of it, I um, looked it up, 33 by 25. So I don't know if you could see, I'm going to shoot back on my chair. I hope you can hear me. So 33 centimetres is that. So it's that high and that wide. And I don't know if you can get a judge, but it's it's quite a big book. Um, it's not a pocket Bible. It's a large book. And from what I can gather, it was intended really as a liturgical document. And they think probably um, for Easter, for special occasions, and will have been venerated al almost like a, an icon. Um, and one reason they think that is that, first of all, the... Uh, all the work that's gone into it, I think, but also apparently there's lot there's words missing. It's a very bad copy, um, and so there's uh, 
there's whole words missing from the sentences. And it suggests that the people who are doing the copying didn't really understand what they were copying. I, I, I imagine it's not like me just hammering out. And I, I mean, I do typos all the time. I don't know what you're like, but uh, when you're going at the pace of a calligrapher, you'd think that you could spot an error as you're going along uh, if you understood what you were doing. Um, now, the, the language that it's in is Latin. Um, and it's mostly, uh, it's the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, from the Vulgate. So this is the Latin translation produced by St. Jerome uh, in the fourth century, I think, uh, with a little bit of Latin from earlier translations. And so this has been produced um, in the 900s, something like that, in uh, Kells. It, that's they think that certainly that's where it's associated with, which is somewhere around here. I hope you can see the pointer. This part of Ireland here. This is Kells Abbey, what remains of it. Um, and the uh, monks at Kells were connected with another monastery, which is um, on Iona, uh, St. Columbus. This is the present. Uh, manifestation of this in Scotland um, on Iona which is here so the, the monks here are connected to the monks there and apparently what's happened was that from time to time the Vikings who came over northern Scotland um, and plundered Iona and so what happened is that the community would disperse um, and they would establish um, communities here. And so there is a connection between the two. And they're, they're Columban monks, uh, from what I can research. So they're following the pattern of St. Columba, who's a, a, a Scottish saint who established this community here originally. Um, as you can see, very beautiful. I don't know if anyone's ever been to the Western Isles there at all. Um, okay. So this here is, um, I'm just going to go through some examples of the art and just respond to it. So if you were looking at that and there wasn't this title here, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't really know what I was looking at. It looks like an abstract design. Um, that, so I, I have to read the, uh, <laughs> the captions when I get these images. And so I, this is the Incipit for the Gospel of John. Um, Incipit means is the opening words. <coughs> I have to excuse me, I've got a cough, so from time to time I'm going to be drinking water and uh, trying to suppress a cough. So you, you might be aware of, I was aware of the word incipit, um, meaning the opening flourish of a, a psalm tone. Well, it's also the opening words. And so, in principio erat verbum, in the beginning was the word. And so somewhere in there, I have to say, erat verbum, I, I would struggle to see it. Um, so I'm assuming that they could in their day or else, it's just so ornate that people would just instinctively, they're almost not worried. It's, it, they know it's there. So I can see verbum, I think, um, in principio, maybe, there. Erat, there, where is the bum? I don't know. Um, so it's their, their focus here on these pages is definitely an ornate design. There seems to be an assumption, I'm guessing, that people knew what words were there, very great familiarity with the Gospels. Um, and what you have in this book are these ornate pages at the beginning of each Gospel. Uh, so the first letters are done in this, these complex and beautiful designs, which must have taken many, many hours of work. Uh, they're done in um, inks, natural pigments and dyes that are from crushed plants and minerals. Um, from what I can, uh, from my research, uh, largely in gum Arabic. So probably if, it, if that's the case, it's washable. They're not permanent, all of them. Um, and 
generally what seems to the, the, the method of work seems to be by laying down lines and then infilling afterwards. So you have these broad structures which are created and then filled in. Um, the book itself consists of, as I say, the four gospels, uh, and then you have preliminaries, canons, and commentaries. So um, you would quite often have um, the lives of the uh, evangelists, for example. Uh, the canons is really like an index, I'm just telling you what's there. Um, and then um, commentaries on the gospels. And so there are set commentaries that would be used to date from the church fathers and became standard in these books. Um, now, it might interest you that the, the language is in Latin. Um, the pattern of uh, the Western uh, Brits and the Celts is that uh, up to the about 400 AD, uh, Britain was occupied. So we're talking about the British Isles. I don't think Ireland at this stage. But the British Isles were occupied by uh, the uh, Romans and it was largely Christian. The Romans abandoned the British Isles, and then you had influxes of Anglo-Saxons who were pagan, and they pushed the Celtic inhabitants and the Brits, Britons, to the western parts and the northern parts. And so you, and they were still Latin speakers, uh, many of them. And so you had this uh, people writing and speaking Latin. Of course, La Latin was, would still be the official language of the church and these would be this would be the official language of the gospel okay let's just move on um, here is a, a a design showing the symbols of the four evangelists and so in this sense this is well absolutely according to tradition so they're on what would have been um a remote part of uh, Western Europe, um, but nevertheless an enclave of uh, culture and learning. Um, and so th they were fully in touch with tradition. And so you have the four evangelists here, the four symbols, uh, portrayed in a, in a style which is uh, as in accord with the whole book actually that is it that is consistent with the iconographic tradition so um, anyone who's seen any uh, other lectures i've given will be aware that i i tend to rely on benedict the 16th uh, as an authority in artistic matters in his book the spirit of the liturgy he says that there are four or sorry three authentic liturgical styles um, the iconographic the uh, Gothic and the Baroque, he says, at its best, was this sort of qualification, uh, not the High Renaissance, it's worth noting. Um, and the iconographic really covers all Christian art from the time that uh, it developed as a distinct style, which would be in the early centuries of the church, uh, when artists were able to work and paint freely. So beginning as about 300, 400 AD, you start to get the development of this distinctive style uh, that really developed organically from the um, classical style of Roman and Greek art at the time. Um, and then um, the, the tradition was very clearly established and became the standard across the whole of Christendom. And as with all authentic traditions, um, it, it had certain principles which defined it and people would not break those but it was able to adapt and reinvent and reinvent itself according to particular places and particular times so in the west you we tend to think of icons as uh, really um the style of the greek and russian church today for example greek icons russian icons perhaps if you know a little bit more you might say well the byzantine churches such as the Melkites, I better mention those if Father is listening, um, in the Catholic Church. Um, but actually, as well as that, there are Western traditions of iconography which flourished right up to the time of the Romanesque, around 1100, 1200 AD. And Celtic art and 
this sort of Anglo-Saxon Irish art that um, is absolutely consistent with that, but it clearly it has its own style. Now, what, what, characteri what characterizes this style is, as you can see, a strong emphasis on ornate decoration. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, and then highly abstracted figures. If you compare the way that um, these artists painted with the sort of painting that would, be, would have happened in Macedonia or in Mount Athos at the same time, the Greek um, iconography of the time was much more, um, much more naturalistic. It corresponded to natural appearances. Still iconographic, still uh, working in accordance with the prototype, but nevertheless um, consistent uh, with it. And so what, it, what we see here is really a picture of um, more communication than you would imagine within uh, the Christian world, uh, certainly through monastic connections. There were, there were lines of communication. Um, now, what, uh, I, I'm not going to talk at length about iconography. That's a, a lecture in itself. But just to say that what characterizes the iconographic style, uh, the key elements are that it is a desire to portray uh, mankind in union with God. And um, so the theology which governs the stylistic elements um, really is the theology of heaven. You call it, if we were talking about John Paul II's um, theology of the body, which I'm sure some of you have studied a little bit of that, um, he talks about eschatological man, man in union with heaven. It's, it's what we all hope to be. And so the theology which governs the style is, is really asking the question, what will we look like in heaven as far as we can grasp it uh, in this life? And so um, what features show this? Well, it's highly abstracted. They want to show that this really is pointing to another world. Um, it tends to be... Uh, they tend to describe form with line. And so well, to, I'll contrast this with tonal description later on, tonal description of form later on. Uh, but the artists draw with lines first and then add detail after that. Um, and it will live in the plane of the painting. Uh, heaven is a place that is outside time and space. And so that flatness and that lack of perspective and depth is by design. It's not. Um, it's not that they couldn't draw or didn't know how to. Uh, you can see there's immense skill in control of the, the quill pen here, um, but it's, it's deliberately trying to suggest a place that is related to, but nevertheless distinct from where we are, uh, the fallen world. And the idea is to try and uh, connect a, us to it in our imaginations. This is the importance of symbols, uh, that a symbol or a sign, an image, um, put, uh, connects us uh, through our imaginations to the thing portrayed. So there is the image and then there is the prototype. And this is hugely important. Remember um, that uh, later on, that, that people were martyred um, in order to protect, to defend, the principle of having images in church and this wasn't eventually in the seventh ecumenical council in 787 the church didn't simply say that um, images were desirable they said that they are we must have them uh, because they are so crucial to our understanding of how we can have um, relate the things that we can touch and see to the things we can't so this is why we would have these in, in the Bible. Um, it's very, very important that we understand that images are important, that they connect our imaginations to the, the prototype in heaven. Now, these four images come from the vision of Ezekiel. Uh, he saw um, an angel with a man, an eagle, an ox, and a lion. Um, and by convention, these are, have come to symbolize the four evangelists, so clearly appropriate for a book containing uh, the, the four Gospels. And so we have Matthew as a lion, Mark as an eagle, John as a 
uh, sorry, an ox is for Luke, an eagle for John, a lion for Mark, and a man for Matthew. So a man is what we would normally think of as an angel with wings. Um, now that's the um, the symbolism according to Saint Jerome. It isn't absolutely standard. Earlier, other church fathers uh, felt that, that they, they would you know change them around. It, it was only eventually, by the time of Saint Jerome, that it became settled as a standard for symbolism. But um, interestingly, the artist of the Book of Kells um, happily adopted this. Okay. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, this is fully iconographic uh, in style. This is Christ enthroned. Um, and I think I, as much as anything, just wonder at the beauty and intricacy of this and the brightness of the colors. Um, and I just want to compare it, first of all, with there is a more traditional, well, that's actually a painting that I did. So that's a, in a more uh, Russian iconographic style. But you see, broadly speaking, we have the same format, Christ seated uh, with the four evangelists uh, around him, carrying the word out to the four corners of the world. Okay, and there um, is a detail of that. And just beautiful. Do you see how uh, they're using line to describe form? And I don't know if anybody is aware of, uh, has tried to um, represent things with line. I'm sure some of you will have done. Um, we tend to think of it as a simple form of art, that line drawing for children will begin with, with lines, drawing outlines. But there's so much more to this than simply drawing an outline. First of all, notice how there is a calligraphic flow to the lines and a rhythm there. Um, so even if this weren't, we, we're looking at a detail, so even if we couldn't tell what it was, there is a beauty in the abstract design of the placement of these lines in two dimensions. Um, and the artist is happy to abstract, to distort the figure in order to preserve the two-dimensional harmony of the graphic design. Um, and this is something that characterizes very much Celtic art. They're, they're so um, attached to the, uh, the abstract decorative design that they will happily move the, the proportions of the figure around in order to make sure that it, it's, um, it looks harmonious as a whole. Other things to notice, um, for example, you have the uh, folded cloth here. And if you um, do an icon painting class, I just, I'm always curious about this, how it's easier to see here. You have a line which comes down here and actually will then come to here, typically like this. So it isn't a zigzag, single zigzag line here. You have one line coming down, it goes round the corner and defines the far edge of that fold. Do you see that? And then this line comes down, finds the far edge, and it stops there. And there's a gap between the two. And the gap they would put in very often gold paint, or in this case, yellow. I don't know if this is literally gold. It might be, um, and you, this marks the, un, the edge of the garment, but it's very important to have a gap there. And so this comes down to here, then you have a line coming to here, one to here, one to here like that. And when I was, did icon painting classes, I was taught to draw folded cloth, <coughs> excuse me, in exactly that way. This is absolutely according to the tradition. So this is how the monks did it in uh, the west of Ireland in the 10th century. It's how I was taught in my icon painting class uh, in the 21st century. Notice also how the, the, the width of the line changes. And this is the mark of, of a skilled draftsman in... Um, who's used to describing form in line. You don't just have simple, even width of line. 
what what a line is doing um, if you want to represent something is marking an horizon between two objects that that, that uh, and you have the line when we can distinguish one from the other so i'm just looking at myself in the uh, the picture that you see of me and you can see my shoulder there for example and you know that that shoulder is there because it's dark behind and the shoulder is lighter. So there's a contrast. Um, now, you could um, represent that by darkening the whole background, having a flat tonal area there that's dark and a lighter tonal area here. And where the two areas meet, you would define the shoulder. That's how artists work if they draw, if they're using a tonal description. So a Baroque artist will do that. I'm going to show you a a Rembrandt later on to show you how he does it. But iconographic and Gothic artists, they ab abbreviate this. They just draw a line to mark that boundary. And when the, the contrast is great, you do a thicker line. When it's so very great contrast there, virtually no contrast there. So that that just looking at the little picture of myself <coughs> and hoping you can see it as I do, that it's almost as if the shadow bleeds into my figure. Strictly, if you're, if you're doing a line representation, you, the line would disappear there. You just have one moving into the other. Strong line here, fainter line here. It's where you have contrast that you have a strong line and where you don't, you have a thin line. Now, what, it's very difficult, it takes great skill to use line in that way because when we know that the object is there, we want to draw a line and distinguish it. Uh, and the skilled artist will be aware of that. There's something else that's coming into play is that the artist wants to draw our attention to certain parts of this. He wants us to see that rather than that primarily because this is Christ, this is the most important part of the page. So what he does, he draws thicker, bolder lines. And that is the equivalent of accentuating the contrast between the two. And so the, he, he, has to be, he has to be aware of how we will look at this uh, by the way that he draws the lines. And so um, it's not simply a case of drawing an outline. And so there's great skill involved on the part of this artist in order to do that. Now, he uses flat color to distinguish as well. So he can contrast this with this um, by coloring this with brown ink and this with this sort of yellow ochre here. So he has that at his disposal. But for the, um, the artist, this is a secondary um, aspect. It's a supporting player. If there were no colour whatsoever, you would still see this in the same way just by virtue of the line. And it is an extraordinary level of skill which allows an artist to do that. Um, it's, it's, um, it's really, it's actually difficult if anyone is trying to do it themselves. Okay. Um, and again, I just, if you just look at the detail here, the beauty with which they do it. Now, here is um, so, so an example of the calligraphy, uh, which in itself um, is a, an expression of art. There's great skill. Um, all of these initial letters of verses and sentences, um, they, they must have had a lot of time um, in order to do this. Um, and uh, again, I just marvel at the beauty of it. And here's a detail extraordinary um, and you see how the control is there just as with the drawing of the width of the letter very very precise and presumably this just it just comes with a natural hand they're able to add these little de um, designs here <coughs> excuse me and again what what is the, what does the artist want us to focus on here he doesn't want us to look at that in preference to that. So he uses deliberately thinner lines and doesn't use strong color. He's suggesting color, but he doesn't want 
very, very deep colour because he doesn't want the eye to home in on that initially. So the whole thing is very carefully balanced and worked out um, as a visual work of art, even the writing. Here is um, the genealogy of Jesus from St. Luke's Gospel. And again, do you see the, the beautiful way in which there is a sense of graphic design in setting this out? And the, there is something that always occurs to me when I, when I think of this. Um, we can do calligraphy. To, there are some people teaching it and studying it. It isn't totally a lost art. Um, and I've often wondered whether we, it would be worth creating something like the Book of Kells today. Uh, if we had the artists and we had the calligraphers, would it be worthwhile? It'd be a very expensive project. Um, and somebody did try to um, create something along a similar lines recently called the St. John's Gospel. I don't know, uh, Gospel Project. You may be aware of that. Um, and so, in fact, my um, icon painting teacher, Aidan Hart, did some of the illustrations for us. He was commissioned to do so. And that was a, um, a huge operation to produce just one gospel. And the thing that occurs to me um, afterwards, or occurred to me afterwards, um, is, is it worthwhile? Because um, it isn't just a case of that we need to produce, we want to produce something of great beauty. Certainly um, the gospel book will have been venerated. I think this will have been a liturgical book. I don't know that they would have had a full lectionary which set the readings out Sunday by Sunday in the way that we do today. I'm, I'm imagining that actually they would have looked up the readings in this book um, on, on a particular Sunday. So this is a liturgical object of great beauty that they ought to be venerated, but um, also uh, to be read. And um, so to my mind, um, if it isn't read, then it's, it, it isn't worth doing. Um, and on the whole, I don't know whether people would read something that was done like this today. Um, maybe if you had a beautiful copy um, set out as a lectionary and then um, with beautiful um, paintings and drawings in order to um, bring the uh, lector into the right frame of mind, um, you might. Uh, but it's, it's something that we need to be uh, to think about carefully. Um, if we're going to um, recreate the culture, we need to do things that really are going to connect with people today. And so I'm not saying, I'm not dismissing it, but we have to think about the, the value of doing something like this. Clearly in its day, it had great value. Okay, back to this. Now, this is something called the Eusebian Canon. Again, these are part of the, another of the, one of the preliminary pages. Um, and uh, really this is just an index. And it's, it's quite interesting when I was reading about this that they said it was probably useless. It, it doesn't seem to relate to any of the internal pages of the book at all. Uh, so while it's, it's, it's in some ways setting out the order of what appears within the book, um, it couldn't have been used to, to actually look anything up because the pages aren't numbered, for example. <coughs> and um, I don't know um, precisely then, if you might ask the question, how would they know where to go within the gospel? Well, I, I can't answer that for the Book of Kells directly, but I, I do know that in Illuminated Psalters, one of the uh, main purposes of every now and again having these very ornate uh, illuminated pages uh, was to be effectively bookmarkers. People would know that certain chapters and certain psalms, for example, uh, were um, somewhere in relation to, say, just after or just before. Uh, a particular illumination, which was like a bookmark. And so that's how they would find uh, pages within the book. Uh, and I'm guessing that um, that's people who are familiar with this book, this is how they would find certain verses um, which they, they wanted to find to read. Okay. 
And again, just, just here's a detail, just stunningly beautiful um, hand here. Um, we have the four evangelists contained within this panel here. Okay. Now here is a, um, a, a page of, this is the Blessed Virgin Mary. So it's just Our Lady and Our Lord here. Um, now, uh, they think that there, there might be three of, maybe three artists have contributed to this. So it's a, it's a, it's a, the product of a workshop. It isn't a single artist or a single calligrapher. And they, they um, tend to, to decide that by looking at the materials that different people use and the, particularly the colors, the range of colors. Um, so it might, that, that might be the case. I don't know how well really they can do that. I mean, you could imagine that one artist might develop with time or just on a, at a particular time, certain colors would be available, but not at others. It's not as if uh, they always, they had the sort of artist colorman shop down the road in Kells at the time. I imagine it, you, you, it would be quite difficult to get hold of some of these materials at various times. But that, that is, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that is the accepted opinion. Um, now, uh, for all the beauty of the um, outer design, I don't know what you feel about this, but I, I have to say, I feel that this is a little clumsy. Um, and if I was to, to draw this, I'd want to modify Christ a little bit. Um, and you get the sense that the artist is very good at abstract design um, and less skilled at the, the figurative work here. Also, strictly, this goes against the iconographic prototype. You wouldn't have ordinarily uh, Christ in profile in the absolute strict application of the iconographic style. Although I said it, it, is, it, it does conform to it. Um, you have figures in full face or three quarter profile. You can always see two eyes. Um, and the idea behind that is it shows that um, <clears throat> people in heaven are able to, are open to be seen and can see you. So it's the idea that um, when we're in heaven, uh, we, when we behold something, we know all there is to know about it. And so symbolically, they always show saints um, revealing themselves. And so the seeing both eyes is a way of showing that. Now, the, the artist here has a problem in that he's trying to show our Lord looking at Our Lady. And so very often what you do is you would show that in a, um, a traditional icon, you'd have Christ here in three-quarter profile, You'd see the two eyes and strictly speaking then he's looking out at us he's not and he's not looking up at our lady um and but th th that's what you have to do the artist here has decided to break the rules a little bit and have it have uh our lord looking up at our lady here so that's just something that strikes me as someone who studied iconography um here's a, an example of what they call the breves cause so these are gospel commentaries uh, that are within the book. Again, beautifully represented, um, just beautiful, elaborate detail here. Um, and they're standard commentaries that, uh, so they're not from the monks themselves. They're handed down uh, and they're from the church fathers. Um, okay. And... Right, and this is another example. Um, I'm just coming to a close here. I can't believe the time has passed. So this is St. John the Evangelist. I just want to um, just see the beautiful swirls here. Again, gorgeous work. Um, the incipit of the Gospel of Matthew. Um, I had to look up what, what the words would be here. Quoniam quidem, for indeed, uh, would be the two first Latin words. Again, I couldn't make that out. I, I guess there might be a Q there, Q there. Um, 
and I, I wonder how recognizable that would have been in, at the time. Um, if people would just know that those were the first two words of the gospel. And so they're not worried about clearly representing them. Um, the, their desire here is to produce a beautiful first page. The other thing to, to be aware of, that the, the standard word for um, illuminations is that generically they're called miniatures. And um, they're called miniatures not because they're small. Uh, the, this is not a small um, drawing. So some of them were small, um, but they, they're called miniature because the pigment, which very often they would lay down first, the first drawing, if you like, which you couldn't erase things. It was not like you had a, an eraser with a graphite pencil. So you lay the lines down first in a, in a red color, and then you'd darken them up when you were sure of um, your position. And the red color is red lead. It's lead oxide, uh, highly poisonous. Um, but the, the Latin word for the red oxide, I think, is minin, something like that. And so it became, it came to refer to the style um, of illumination. They called the miniatures as it moved into the English language um, around 1500, 1600. So this is later. Um, and then uh, because many of them were small, certainly on a small scale in comparison to grand scale Baroque art, for example, um, it came to mean small-scale art as well. And then the word miniature um, migrated again, the meaning migrated, and it came to mean anything that's small, not just painting. So it's interesting etymology there. Um, it's St. Matthew offering us his gospel. So I, can you see, I hope you could see the full Cairo there um, on your screens. Yes, we can. Okay, so it's a, in English terms, you say it's a cross and a P. That's what they're doing. Uh, again, not very obvious. They, they, they don't, you can see, I guess that is the chi, it was, and then there's the row there. Um, so it's not done in the conventional way, uh, but they don't let that get in the way of a beautiful design. They, they there's, really are given to having absolute ornate beauty, and they really go to town. Um, I was told that uh, this style of decoration came uh, into Celtic art because uh, prior to Christianization, they were nomadic peoples, and so their art would be abstract design on things that could be easily be picked up and uh, would move with them. So things like belt buckles and brooches and things like that. And so when they started to uh, write and do art, art illumination, they brought that um, flair for abstract swirling design uh, into their art. Another thing that's interesting is that this beautiful flow <coughs> of art, it always stri struck me uh, when I started to do this that if you were to describe these mathematically, they are ellipses and parabolas. Uh, and I studied physics at university. And uh, they are, uh, you, so you used to plot data on a graph, and then you try and do a smooth curve through the data on the assumption that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that's the way that the natural order behaved. And so these um, natural flows actually describe in an abstract way the mathematical behavior of nature. They correspond to it. it they really are beautifully designed ellipses and parabolas, which um, the, the reason I think that we relate to them, it's just my personal idea, my personal theory, is that they do correspond to an aspect of the natural order, which we subsequently see in so many um, scientific papers in the, in the mathematical uh, formula that describe uh, physical processes, for example. Incidentally, Cairo is the first two letters of Christos in Greek. Um, and also, um, again, according to my research, it, it was something that was used to mean good. Creston, I think, is Greek. There'll be Greek scholars. I don't speak 
Greek at all. Um, but I believe it's it's a word for good. And it was used as a sort of, you know, the equivalent of a thumbs up, if you like, um, prior to Christianity. And so because of the correspondence, it became a, a, a nice way of saying this is good. It was a nice correspondence there. And this has moved into the tradition. Uh, and then I just wanted to show you this. This is a, one of those initial letters of, of a verse in the book. And just look at the beautiful detail here. Everything going over and under. Uh, not, so it looks like a, a brooch or a buckle. And then just as an example, I'll finish on that. And uh, there is a Rembrandt. And do you see what I, I, I meant when I said that um, Rembrandt, you can't distinguish. There's no distinction between the shoulder of this lady, might be his mother. So this is Rembrandt painting the Baroque style in the, uh, the 17th, 17th century. <clears throat> so he just doesn't paint it. He just has the shadow blending one into the other. There's the merest suggestion, but very little contrast here. But we see it very happily in our mind's eye. Now, the, the artist who draws with line understands that well and is manipulating those horizons. So you'd have a stronger line here than you would here. But at the same time, he wants to be us to wants to draw attention to certain parts. And so he will accentuate it um, in, in addition to that. And so it's a balancing act that they're playing. And I say Celtic, but there's a, just a, a, another example of the abstract art. And even if there were no figurative uh, figures within it, there was no figurative element. It, it is just um, an object of great beauty. The same skill that you see in Chinese calligraphy or in Arab calligraphy, for example, this delight in the flow and the graceful movement of the line, um, which I think in real time mimics the, the, the grace of a beautiful gesture or, or dancer. Okay, and I, I talked about this earlier. There's, I think this would have been a book that would have been venerated um, appropriately, but it is important that there's two things that are very important here. It, we must venerate things that are worthy of veneration. Um, and it's a facility that ought to be developed within us because, because in order to have faith, we must be able to uh, believe in things that we can't see and touch. Um, and it is through images and signs and symbols that we do this. So it's something that we've fallen away from greatly uh, in the modern age. And so if there is, I did discuss earlier whether it's worth having a book like this today, um, provided that it can be read and it will be read, uh, there is value in having this ornate beauty because it tells us this is important. This, this is the word of God. And it is worth this time and expense, effectively, um, in, in the creation of it and this love, because it, that, in a way, in the, is then transferred to the prototype, who is the Word of God, who is Christ. Okay, I will stop there. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested to hear any questions you might have or any thoughts. Excellent. Thank you so much, Professor Clayton. Okay, uh, let's start with this. Uh, Jeffrey Williams is wondering, uh, he's heard that it is true that no two designs in the book are alike. Um, did you come across a fact like that or something in your research? Can you confirm or deny that, uh, Professor Clayton? Um, well, I, <clears throat> I don't know and I haven't seen them all, but it... it uh, it would seem likely everything is done individually and even if they're trying to do things identically they're not going to turn out the same um i would have, because you're not this isn't printed um it's as easy to do something differently as the same it's, in fact it's easier to do something differently than the same so uh my, i'm just speculating i would say it's very likely but i i don't know actually i haven't come across that i'm going to uh meld pat and Amy and Robert's question together. They all have to do with different um, cultures kind of come together in this. So um, 
if I were to combine it, uh, maybe I'll just read them side by side. I see a lot of similarities with Islamic art, as you had mentioned, Professor Graydon. What possible communication or crossover in the 900s uh, would there have been between Celtic and Arabic design? Uh, and then also, Robert is wondering, um, were these techniques for illuminate, illuminating influenced by other cultures such as the Greek or Roman or uh, Vikings? <coughs> well, there's certainly connect, um, contact between monastic communities across Christendom, um, East and West, even during this period. Um, and so there were, some of those will have been in Arab-occupied lands. Um, in regard to uh, Arabic art, remember that a lot of the Islamic culture is really adapted from Byzantine culture. It comes from Christian culture originally. Um, <clears throat> and where you have um, abstracted art, so for example, the calligraphic flow of line, which you see there, um, but also another aspect of Islamic art is the geometric patterned art, which is part of the Christian tradition as well. Um, it all goes back to the same root, which is Greek and Roman, actually. So it, it, it all began in classical culture. And so they have the same root. So whether um, there is direct uh, cross-fertilization, I don't know. There certainly was in the Mediterranean. So in the, for example, in the 11th century, in Sicily, for example, there are churches where you have Byzantine craftsmen, Arab craftsmen, and Western European craftsmen all, all brought together. And so the... the they were very open to looking discerningly at other cultures. Um, so uh, my guess is that there might have been, but even if there wasn't, they have similar roots. Mm -hmm. There's a, this is going to take us in an interesting route here. Um, Anne is writing in and asks, are you familiar with the work of, and I'm sorry if I get this name wrong, uh, Daniel Mitsu? Yes. Uh, he works in the medieval style and has recently completed a beautiful rendition of Our Lady and Doer of Knots. I, I pulled up an um, image of that work. I'll, I'll share it in just a second. Um, incorporating Celtic knot work in the design. He is also in the midst of a long-term project entitled Sumula Pictoria, which seeks to depict the Old and New Testament. This project seems to be relevant to the question of how an artist would approach a similar project to the Book of Kells today. And uh, there was, tying to that, Frank was writing in and was, was wondering how have or can artists use the Book of Kells as a visual inspiration in their art? And uh, let me just quickly share that um, image of the Lady and Doer of Knots that was referenced in that question. You can certainly see similarities with uh, those patterns along the outside. Um, so what, what was the question? Sorry, I was just admiring that. What was the question again? I, yeah, I don't well, well, the first question was just, are you familiar with him? And yeah. so the answer is yes. Um, but then um, Anne was kind of commenting, oh, this artist uh, seems to be a good example of how these techniques or this approach um, could be used um, in projects today. And that's, that really springs us to the primary question, which is this, how have or can artists use the Book of Kells as a visual inspiration in their art? Well, we, we always good artists look to the past to be guided in the present. And so, um, for example, if I wanted to do something decorative and beautiful and I felt it, it, it clearly connects with people today. It, incidentally, I didn't mention, it's in Trinity College Dublin Library, um, and it was moved there by one by, at the time of Oliver Cromwell, the conquest of Oliver Cromwell, um, who was this puritanical uh, Christian. So despite that, they, they were prepared, you know, the, the beauty of it probably preserved it. So it's connected with people through centuries. And, and um, so the inspiration will come from just looking for ideas and trying to say, which, which, how will this connect with people today? 
The one thing I would say when we do that is I really think we should get away, if possible today, from the idea of um, illustrations. Uh, for there, there is, it's, it's, it's often said, for example, I, I'll, see, I'll tell you what I mean. I'm not against illustrating the gospel, it came out wrong. What, what I want to say is that it's often said that, for example, the stained glass windows in Gothic churches are the uh, pre a presentation of the gospels for the illiterate. Now, I don't believe that, actually, because I think that people uh, could talk to each other in those days. It might have been for the deaf um, and illiterate, but not for, not for the um, illiterate, because people could talk to each other. What these images were in the churches were an alternative presentation of key aspects of the mysteries of the faith that were there to um, form us and inspire us in the worship. And what we have lost today in our thinking, even in our approach to beautiful imageries, and even in images that we choose for church, is the, the, the understanding that the primary function of this ought to be um, of, of sacred art ought to be to inform our worship mm -hmm. and so if I was if I was to say what is most um, important today it is to make use of art that will draw us in in the in the in the process of worshiping and we may well need to even change the manner of our worship so even in um, quite devout, devout Roman Rite churches that are interested in art, if you, I, it struck me that they're not, people are not using the art in the course of their worship. And so what happens then is that it's, it tends to become devotional. It's something that we consider um, before Mass, after Mass, um, or uh, in, order, in, in our sort of private contemplation and meditation. Now that is wonderful, that is great, and you can imagine uh, the art of the Book of Kells doing that. But if, if, it, if it does so at the expense of our engagement with the liturgy, then there's a problem. And I, there's a whole task of, I think, catechesis or mystagogical catechesis, in which we once again become uh, alive to this, um, in the actual act of worship, that this is not a pious, hands clasped, eyes closed affair. Um, and it's one thing that we can learn from um, the Eastern Church a little bit, is the way that people engage directly with images in the course of worship. And I don't want, you know, Eastern Christianity is distinct from and a complement to Western Christianity. So, I'm not saying we always directly copy one or the other, but it is something that I think has dropped away from the Roman rite. And so what I would want is an emphasis on art, which does that in our churches. Hmm. There's uh, two quick questions I want to um, answer. One's coming in anonymously asking, please explain when, where, why people were martyred to protect images in our churches. Um, we'll include a link to Dr. Marshner's talk um, on iconoclasm and, and, and the importance of sacred images. Um, so just look for the further study email for that. Also, Angela is wondering if um, this work can be digitized similar to scrolls. I'll also include a link recently, I think just about two months ago, a whole collection of illuminations was uh, digitized and put online. So um, I'll make sure to, oh good, I already have a note for that. I'll make sure to uh, drop a link for that in the uh, email as well. Yes, I, and I have to say that we, we worry about the internet, but I'm telling you, that it's one of the great Google images. You just, you just put in Book of Kells and there you can print up amazing <laughs> images of these things, which wouldn't have been possible, I don't know, Certainly when I began, I'd have had to travel. Or you know, you're buying expensive facsimiles or something. <laughs> right. Very, yeah. very fortunate today. It, um, is pretty, it is pretty incredible. The, there was a question before that, so before I ranted on. Oh, on. no, that's fine. They were asking, uh, could it be digitized? So I'm just going to point them to a link that's in the further study email. There are a couple uh, other questions, if you don't mind um, 
maybe just take one or two more here. Yeah. Um, Bill Gerdhart is writing in and, and uh, also, I'm sorry, panelists, if you have a question, you just simply raise your hand. So if I've missed you, um, okay, good. Um, Bill writes in, I'll get you after this one, Bob, and uh, asks, do you think the gospel readers of the book of Kells would have recognized the extraordinary beauty of the book, or were they so accustomed to this type of elaborate art that they may not have understood its pricelessness? Pricelessness. Um, I think they would have understood it. I, I, I mean, your guess is as good as mine, um, but I, I think that they would have done because um, although it's, uh, it's, it was art of its time, and so in that respect, you'd say, well, they were more, they would ex expect it to be done more than today, for example. Um, nevertheless, the availability of art was so much less that. I think they would have, I, I really think they would have marveled at it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know for certain. Mm -hmm. I, I think the test of this is <coughs> that, I, I, again, that idea that even the Puritan, Oliver Cromwell, uh, invaded Ireland, and even he wasn't prepared to destroy it. <laughs> I think that says something. He's prepared to destroy a lot of things in Ireland, but not the Book of Kells. <laughs> I wanted these. I wanted to combine these two anyway. So let's do this, Bridget. Yeah. And uh, no, I'm sorry, not Bridget. Um, Eileen <clears throat> and Julia. Okay, how long did the Irish create these types of books? Uh, why did these and why did these books fall away from production? And kind of tied in here. Do you know of any monasteries that are currently creating art like the Book of Kells today? Um, I don't know of monasteries. The closest that comes to it is Daniel Mitsui, who's based in the Chicago area, whose art we saw. Um, why does it fall away? Well, the, the advent of the printing press would be one reason why the, gen, the art of illumination fell away in general. Mm. Um, but also, um, just fashions change and people change. So one of the marks of any tradition is that it had it has to uh, resonate with the people of its time and place. And there's no accounting for precisely what will do that at any time. So um, you can imagine, for example, that the Romanesque art, which is more naturalistic um, and came in around 1130 or something, people would see that and would just, it's new, it's something that's beautiful in itself, say, oh, we want that. Mm -hmm. and so, this sort of thing would happen and the it's only over over centuries that then you say well something will transcend its own time um, and it has this lasting value um, now uh, the, the as to the, the how widespread this style was it was um, it's associated with I think with the British Isles I, I call it insular I think is the the way you character the, the, the generic name for it in academia so it just means of the island um, and so it's uh, a British Isles. It's certainly you get this in Anglo-Saxon art. Mm -hmm. that's fine. Um, and one of the things that stopped it in Britain was the invasion of the Normans, who were, who, uh, were interested in Romanesque styles. So William the Conqueror, certainly, uh, I don't know how far he got into Ireland, but certainly up you know, the rest of the British Isles, and that will have had an effect, I think. Mm. Excellent. Well, Professor, we really appreciate the time you've given us.